Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Bargain Bin Reviews. I'm the Bargain Bin Hobo, and we have a couple of firsts on the show today. First off, this bad boy. This is a PVR, and it was given to me by my friend Rafa. Essentially, it allows me to record console footage, so we're going to look at a console game today. The other first for the show is that we're going to look at a licensed game. Now, if you've watched online gaming videos before, you probably know the stigma behind licensed games by now. But if you don't, this is about getting you up to speed. There are tons and tons of games that are made to tie in with movies and TV shows. The problem is they're usually rushed out the door to meet film premiere dates, so oftentimes they suck. <coughs> <coughs> oh, sorry. I must be catching a cold. But TV show games are different in the sense they don't have such strict deadline. As long as the show is still on the air, it shouldn't really matter when the game is released. Right? The problem is, there are still TV games that get a lot of hate just as well as movie games. The particular licensed game we're going to look at today is this, Kids Next Door Operation Video Game on the PS2, but it was also made for GameCube and Xbox. If you haven't seen Kids Next Door, it's a lot like Power Rangers except that teenagers are kids and the monsters are adults. The show is pretty popular and it still is today, but it's ended, however, I've heard there's a reboot on the grapevine. Now, the game was used to promote the short-lived Kids Next Door trading card game, and each copy of the game included this exclusive card here, which I'm not showing because it also has a plot spoiler on it. So, if you want to find out what's on the card, you'll have to Google it. Kids Next Door was developed by High Voltage Software and published by Global Star Software. And now, with all that out of the way, it's time to hobo up! The story for Kids Next Door Operation Video Game is that a lot of the most dangerous villains to the Kids Next Door have broken out of the Arctic prison and are wreaking havoc. Numbers 1 through 5, also known as Nigel, Hoagie, Kuki, Wally, and Abigail respectively, need to round them all up and bring them to the new prison on the moon. The problem is, they might be playing into a trap. You know, given the context of the game, the story's actually pretty good. And I think, could be wrong though, that the game was written by the writers of the show. Is that true? Again, I'm not sure. Don't quote me. But anyway, now you move on to the gameplay. There are three basic styles of gameplay. The first one is Run and Gun, which is assigned to Nigel and Kuki. Nigel's stages have a greater emphasis on clearing out enemies. Nigel only has a single jump, but he can also do a grappling hook move, which will get him to areas he couldn't normally reach. Kuki does play fairly differently from Nigel in more than one way. First off, she can double jump and glide. My guess just those giant sleeves on her sweater, I'm not sure. But also, Kuki's stages have a greater emphasis on collecting things rather than combat, and she doesn't even start the stage with a gun. And then when she does get a gun, it's not designed for combat, it's designed to complete what objective you're doing, and I'll get to how she gets her gun in a bit. The second gameplay style is Brawler, which is assigned to Wally and Abigail. And they play pretty much the same, although I think that Wally can't do a wall jump like Abigail can. Now I have a rather embarrassing confession to make. You see, when you press square as Wally, he punches, and Abigail kicks when you hit square. I thought they'd, it was weird that they just assigned punch and kick to different buttons for the characters, and I realized that it's just fast and heavy attack assigned to the, the correct buttons in the controller, it just looks cosmetically different. It was rather embarrassing though. Like Nigel and Kuki, Wally and Abigail both get an extra little thing in their levels. Now the thing is though, it only happens in their first levels. The final type of gameplay is flying rail shooter and this is done with Hoagie. Hoagie is given a small plane in which he can move around to dodge enemy fire, but he can't decide how fast he's going. Like the other characters, Hoagie also gets extra things in his levels, and in his case, it's just more ways to fire aside from just a single shot. But it is pretty helpful, especially when there's a lot of enemies around. Also, Hoagie can use a Gamma Guard, as it's called, to absorb enemy fire to build up his chicken explosion, which nukes weaker enemies and damages stronger enemies, and you often need to do this. Checkpoints are fairly common, so if you do happen to die, you just respawn at the last checkpoint, so dying is really more of an inconvenience, given you have infinite lives. Each character has their own kind of special moves they can use, which can be really, really helpful in sticky situations, but they need to be spared as you only have a limited power meter. And also, the game has a lot, and I mean a lot, of different kinds of pickups. There's bags of candy, which replenish your health, soda, and other sugary drinks, which will replenish your power meter, and then there's rainbow monkeys. The game has a lot, and I mean a lot, of secrets to unlock, most of which unlock with the rainbow monkeys. In most levels, with the exception of a few, 25 rainbow monkeys unlocks one secret, there are four secrets in each level, which means you need 100 rainbow monkeys to collect all four secrets in a level. Don't sweat it though, because the game basically craps them out by the barrel full, so unless you're neglecting them like the plague, you are not going to miss any secrets. One of the coolest extras in the game is entered by a cheat instead of by collecting rainbow monkeys, and it lets you play as number 86, the Scottish girl. 
As cool as it is, though, she's basically just number one in a costume. She plays on his levels, and although they did rewrite the dialogue for number 86, not all the captions were rewritten, and in some spots she still speaks with number one's voice. Aside from that, though, it's still a really cool extra, and I'm pretty sure fans of this character really appreciate the inclusion. And there are also super secrets in the game which are really well hidden. To get these ones, you have to do things you wouldn't think to do. So don't be ashamed if you have to consult a guide. Foreshadowing. Foreshadowing. The final collectible that's not mission specific is the spare part. The spare part basically is what gives the extra things and levels. Now for Kuki here, she doesn't start with the gun like I mentioned. She gets the gun when she collects the spare parts. In this particular mission here, it gives her a freeze away which freezes these stupid little hamsters. Sadly, this is where the complaining starts. You see, as much fun as I have with the game, there are some snags here and there that really piss me off. Chief among them is this level. You need to chase these hamsters to be able to progress, but the hamsters move way faster than you. There's no sprint button. You basically have to outsmart the stupid hamsters instead of be able to outrun them. And this is why I'm glad that one of the extras in this level is that you start the freeze rate so this does not happen. And this isn't the only part of the game that would benefit from a sprint button. All the characters move sluggishly, and oftentimes, like in this part here, Abigail can get pelted if she's not moving just right. I have been killed this part numerous times, and I have a lot of deleted footage that would have showed it, except, like I said, I deleted it. My final gripe of the game is that the camera can sometimes be a bit uncooperative, especially in the really tight areas. And when I tried to show this footage, though, my Windows Movie Maker would corrupt the data. I have no idea why it would do that, but just take my word for it when I say that Cameron's game can sometimes get in your way. So the gameplay is pretty good, although there are those snags I mentioned that really piss me off, but aside from that, they're pretty good gameplay. And now we're going to wrap things up with the presentation. You can tell a lot of love went into the game, especially with the loading screens. Each loading screen begins with a drawing that kind of preludes the level. And I have to say it looks really cool and it does add a lot of nice charm and touches. The voice acting is also very good, given the cast came back to voice their characters, so it's very authentic. The music is also very good. For one thing, they actually got to use a theme, which I won't show due to copyright fear. And then there's this level music, which actually fits the theme very well. The animation of the game actually mimics the show's animation very well. So overall, if you're a fan of Kids Next Door, you're going to want to pick this game up. It feels like a lost episode. And now I think it's time I put a rating system in the show. Now let's see here. How does the game play? It does play pretty well. The controls are pretty tight and responsive. And, well, it looks great. sounds great. But those snags do hold it back a little bit. So I'm just going to have to call this one Hobo Proves. Those snags are what held it back from being perfect, in my opinion. And with that, we close the book on the third episode of Bargain Bin Reviews. But, before we actually do close the book, there's two things I should say. First off, I'm going to be including a second show in my channel pretty soon here, and I hope to have it up soon. The second off is that I've created a second channel for gameplay, and I'm going to have a video up there pretty soon. P.S. If you were paying attention, you probably know what it is already. The link to my new channel is in the description. Well guys, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. Hobo, out!